talk to me about Mercedes, Dr. Robs, because again, it looks what it looks like Red Bull are the class of the field. Um, Lewis and George, if they're to be believed, have also made a step on as far as um, stability at the rear of their car. Um, what what jumps off the page when you look at the Mercedes design, if anything at all? I think just the slimness of the side pods is really what I see. So, you know, when you look at it from the front, you still have the width of the side pods, which is quite, you know, a departure from what they had previously, where the, what they thought at that time was, we're going to make the side pods extremely slim in the Y direction, which the Y direction is across the width of the car. They said, we're going to make it slim across the Y direction. This is why they had, you know, the zero pod, even there was a, a small side pod there. Now, after that, they've slowly been evolving the W14, the W14B to now having a bit more sort of outboard width to the side pod shape. So they still have the outboard width. The only difference is that in the Z direction and the up and down direction, it's quite slim when you look at it from front to back and it tapers off very nicely from the front intake all the way to the rear and the rear Coke section of the car. So it's very interesting to see sort of how they've done this because I think what they're now doing is maximizing their undercut by doing that. So they have a real strong undercut and they're working that undercut to bring a lot of clean flow to the rear. They also have a a very modest water slide. Uh, You know, it's not like the AMR 24 water slide where it's a very deep sort of sudden aggressive downwashing water slide. There's a just very gradual, very subtle water slide, which tells me that, you know, they're not necessarily having to work the top air that's coming off of the side pod as hard, which means they must be getting nice clean flow to the rear. So that's definitely something that jumped out. They still maintain the P-shaped inlet, which is quite interesting. So they must be getting gaining something from the P-shaped inlet. I think we talked last time about the push rod in the rear suspension, right? And what that's able to do for them aerodynamically. We didn't get a lot of great photos from the rear to be able to really sort of look up the diffuser and see kind of how it's profiled. But if I was to suspect, I think if you did a side by side between the W14B and the W15, I think that section and sort of the rear kick of the diffuser would look totally different because now, as we talked about last time, they've got more volume to be able to do aerodynamic tricks with. So, and obviously the front wing, you know, we really got a good shot of it uh, in the daylight. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite awesome. Um, It's been, you know, legalized or or officially now told by the FIA and everybody, Hey, this is legal. I know a lot of teams, I guess the story is that other teams are inquiring about, Hmm you know, how this is in the spirit of the regulations or whatever, but I don't believe in any of that stuff. There's the regulations and that's it. So uh, I'll be watching that for sure to see if the FI walks back any of that or if other teams start introducing it now. Oh, and talk to me. Did you see that they, they'd done something last minute with their the anti-dive on the front suspension as well? Oh, oh yes. yes. What, what that... does that mean, Dr. Robs, and, and uh, translate it for us? So basically what, you know, if, if something is anti-dive or just neutral, it's where you have an upper and lower A-arm, okay? So the upper and lower A-arm are essentially the dynamic load suspension elements. And these elements are either at the same height in the Z direction or they're sort of staggered. Now, when it staggers down at an angle looking from front to back, this is called an anti-dive. So suspension is not my... Um, expertise but essentially what it does is that when you connect the points of the upper and the lower suspension arms then you get a point and that point is either higher or lower which is dictating kind of as you hit the brakes how much a sort of uh dive you get it's it's you know pitch some people call it pitch but pitching is more up so they call it a dive when you hit a brake so how much the car is going to squat or dive forward when you jam on the brakes And essentially what this is supposed to do from a dynamic sense with the suspension is it's supposed to aid in reducing that anti-dive, which gives you a more stable aero platform. And that is is a very interesting thought there, but I'm not sure 100% by it because from everything that I've heard, uh, the reason why the RB19 went with the anti-dive originally was for more aero reasons. So what we were talking about before was how much the front suspension elements are kind of 
slowly sort of changing the trajectory of that upwashing uh, air off of the wing to now start to sort of level out and start to kind of downwash as much as possible as it interacts with the side pod and, and everything. So um, I think that Mercedes is kind of experimenting a little bit with this. I mean, testing is the right time to do that, right? And what they've done is they've changed the pickup points on the suspension on the rear upper A arm to where it's either higher or lower, which is changing the angle of the anti dive. So two things you're going to be looking for: one, dynamically, what's going on with my car, right? Is anything changing? You know, they've got accelerometers on the car, which is telling you how much the car is squatting or diving. And so, is anything changing dynamically in that sense when I go from a high pickup point to a lower pickup point? And then aerodynamically as well, what is changing? I wasn't paying close enough attention to see if when we're, they were running the aero rakes behind the front tire, if they ran it in a high pickup point and a low pickup point. I would assume they did because what they're then trying to map is how the flow field is changing with the A-arm location changing. So I think it's genius, honestly. It's brilliant. Um, what I'll be interested to see is is it just something that they're using for testing? And then once they land on the geometry they like, they say, okay, this is our geometry for the year. Or is it a modular design, which means that from one track to the next, based off of everything that they've mapped out during testing, what are the pros and the cons of each, the high pickup point and the low pickup point, you know, maybe it's good for these kinds of tracks and it's not good for other tracks. Right. But this gives you modularity to be able to change that point. So you have an optimal solution for all tracks. Dr. Opt, let me ask you about modularity very quickly before we before I, uh, check your maths on Ferrari. When I see them tinkering um, at this stage with with these fairly fundamental bits of the car, it doesn't fill me with confidence as a Mercedes fan, because I'm thinking surely at this stage with CFD, wind tunnel, you should have a fairly um a, a decent inkling as to the to, to what design philosophy tree you should be barking up right as far as the anti-dye suspension the pods and the inlets whatever um how do you guys with your aero cap on is this am i reading too much into it is there still so many variables that you you have to tinker and this is what testing for or is this mercedes um still not knowing and showing a bit of vulnerability I mean, I, I don't think it's um, too far fetched to to think that that could be a possibility as well. But I like to think of it from, you know, really my engineering cap. So from that side of things, what I would say is if you get to a point in your engineering design evolution that you say, hey, if if I use it in this design at this pickup point, then it works for 75% of the tracks. And if I use it on this, then it works for also 76% or 78% of the tracks. I mean, that might now be, but but if you use both in your design, then it works over 100% of the tracks, you see? It's, it's introducing an additional variable that previously might've been fixed. And you can look at it as, well, they just don't know what they're doing. Or you could look at it as a stroke of genius where somebody said, in order for us to get better overlap and performance over all the racetracks in our calendar, if we just take this element here and we make it instead of a fixed point, a variable point, then we're able to increase the performance over the, the calendar. I think that's what they've done. But the trade-off with that is that you're probably going to introduce maybe a little bit more weight where you might not have had it previously because you're going to need to reinforce two locations instead of reinforcing one location, right? And so that added weight penalty is going to have a net positive for you in your performance. So they must have decided that the overall gain is greater than the loss from the additional weight. And they said, okay, that's what we're going to run with. 